So you're at the session of the Northwestern Hawaiian Island Science and Supportive Management, and we have a truly an all-star cast of presenters this morning that will explain to you a lot of the different types of research being conducted up there. For the most part, the, um, since the, let's see, for the last almost seven years, there's been an increasing movement towards advancing ecosystem science in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. And since the designation of the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands Coral Reef Ecosystem Reserve in 2001, through the proposed sanctuary marine designation process and now as a monument, our real interest as managers is to really understand the system as a whole. And as you know, with one of the, the largest marine conservation projects in the world, this is not an easy task. But I'm very pleased that these speakers who are here are really helping us advance that knowledge. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the first speaker. Don Kobayashi, I've learned, has actually been with the Science Center for close to 20 years. A lot of the work that he's been doing in oceanographic modeling has really advanced our understanding of connectivity throughout the island chain. And he's addressing one of the more challenging questions as to whether it's the retention versus the rec recruitment to different marine areas in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. So with that, Don. Thanks, Malia. Good morning. I'm Don Kobayashi from NOAA Fisheries Pacific Science Center. This morning I'm going to be talking about marine connectivity in the Hawaiian archipelago. Firstly, I'll talk about the modeling approach I'm using and the data sources. I'll present some recent work on Johnston Atoll connectivity to the Hawaiian archipelago. I'll talk about connectivity over the Hawaiian entire archipelago. Uh, a brief look at metapopulation structure modeling approaches and finally some wrap-up in future directions. See some of the analyses that essentially show that the NLOM data has good correspondence to what's observed with the ocean drifters. With the NLOM data as our currents and see what happens when we start releasing virtual larvae into these current fields. The first analysis I'm going to be talking about has to do with Johnston Atoll connectivity to the Hawaiian archipelago. And there's been some compelling evidence uh, both published and unpublished, suggesting links between Johnston Atoll and the archipelago, primarily the mid-archipelago and even the northern parts of the main island chain. I'd like to point out some of the coral work, Acropora and Montipora, uh, biogeographic work that's been suggestive of these patterns, uh, Lobel's work on damselfish, some gastropod work, unpublished work, a lot of anecdotal stuff, Opihi, bonefish, coral disease, um, a lot of things suggesting a linkage between Johnston Atoll and the archipelago. What's interesting about this is that the basic wind and current patterns are going in the opposite direction. So for transport to occur from Johnston Atoll to the archipelago sort of goes counter to what we would have expected just based on passive drift from prevailing conditions. So what we did was just configure the NLOM currents current data into a model and start releasing things at Johnston and see where do they go. Um, can they reach the archipelago? How long would they have to be floating in the open ocean before they could reach the archipelago? Just some basic questions like that. And after doing many, many types of simulations such as you just saw, we can start to accumulate the data and look at, well, what are some larval distributional patterns spatially that we could observe given certain pelagic larval durations. That is, if you're out there for, say, one month versus six months, where do the larvae end up? We can start to map these regions out. Uh, the, the shaded regions are obviously just distributions of larvae after a certain amount of time in the open ocean. So this is showing a one-month pelagic larval duration. Over to the right is a three-month 
and a six month, and we can quantitatively map out these geographic distributions of larvae and start to see where do they intersect the archipelago? Where would larvae from Johnston start to uh, impact the archipelago? And we can see that in this graph, if we tabulated all of the, the long distance transport from Johnston Atoll to mid archipelago or elsewhere, we see that it takes about a 50 day pelagic larval duration before any significant transport to the archipelago could take place. So in red, we see transport from Johnson and Atoll to the Hawaiian archipelago. And in blue, we see retention around Johnston, which intuitively, as you spend more time in the plankton, PLD gets larger, retention drops off. Just as you're out there longer, you're gonna drift away. There's a better chance of drifting away. And of course, finally, better chance of drifting into the, to the archipelago. Well, where did these larvae end up? Well, if we tabulate all the larvae that settled someplace successfully and start to map their distribution, we start to see some interesting patterns. Potential larval transport corridors from Johnston to the Hawaiian archipelago. In this case, we see two, uh, two such evidences of, of transport corridors. Here we see the northerly corridor, corridor, and here perhaps a southerly corridor. And interestingly, these coincide with some known uh, data based on genetics and other field surveys suggesting these linkages that I showed in that first slide where, we all, where this whole thing got started. The story is sort of shaking out in a consistent way that the field evidence is matching the simulated transport of pelagic passive larvae. Moving on into archipelagic connectivity, the next step was to take what was done for the Johnston to, archi to the Hawaiian archipelago sort of approach and apply it to the whole matrix of habitats or geographic strata within the archipelago. And as you can see, just by, even by simplifying the archipelago into say 25 geographic units, there's an incredible number of connections between each of these. Uh, there's just hundreds and hundreds of little lines that would need to be mapped out. We need to know what is the strength of each of those lines in this, in this uh, last slide here. Can it be done? Well, first we'd have to uh, define our geographic strata. So for the archipelago, we can take some high resolution bathymetry and start to just, let's break it down into some, some workable units. So here we have a list of 25 geographic strata defining the archipelago. Um, just some basic summaries of what, was, what went into the simulation modeling. Some of the results were basically total retention and total reception. And what's the difference between that, you ask? Uh, retention is basically keeping your propagules around you, the ones coming back. The ones you sent out, they're the ones coming back. Reception, on the other hand, is what you're receiving, but they were from a different source. So they may be from an adjacent habitat, a different island, a different bank, but not from your natal source. Uh, the differentiation of these two components is typically not done. What's often done in the field is to go to a reef and start counting what's settling, what's recruiting to your study area, and then try to map this into some story about the environment or the oceanography and what brought them there. Um, and why do I show this slide, you might ask, it doesn't show anything. There's no pattern here. Well, that's the most uh, compelling thing about it. There's no pattern between retention and reception. It's saying that if you measure just what hits your reef, you don't have a proxy for either of these components, neither reception or retention. Uh, there's no clear relationship. So in order to really understand the, tr the recruitment and settlement dynamics of any particular system, you have to source what's coming in. You have to know where did they come from. Not just count them, but actually do some kind of sourcing. And that's going to involve uh, some very sophisticated techniques such as uh, genetics. Getting back to all of these tiny lines connecting all of the different strata, can we start to untangle this mess? Can we examine the strength of each of these lines? Well, the answer is yes, we can start. We can start assigning an actual number to each of those lines. We can construct what's called a transition matrix, a dispersal kernel. There's a lot of names for this set of numbers, but basically it's the probability of something starting from someplace, reaching somewhere else, and you just map it out over the whole matrix. 
So for each of those lines, we can basically assign one of these numbers to that line and determine what goes where or what ended up, what ended up here, where did it come from. Uh, there's, so there's several ways of looking at it. We can start to compress the strata into meaningful categories such as main island groups, the northwestern Hawaiian island group. Uh, we can look at it from a different probabilistic perspective by saying what, of what reached here, where did it come from? So of all the things that we find here, what is the probability it came from over there or over there or over there? Um, it's going to be very useful for management strategies and uh, the development of protected areas and so on and so forth. What we find is there's a very strong relationship between pelagic larval duration and what shakes out into these tables of, of dispersal and transport and retention and all that. What could we use these numbers for? All those hundreds of numbers, all those hundreds of lines, what are some possible applications? What, one of the first applications will be looking at metapopulation structure. Uh, metapopulations are basically pop, uh, units of the population that are separated geographically or by some other means, but connected by some portion of the life history. In this case, the portion of the life history is the pelagic eggs and larvae, which are dispersive. But once things settle in insular species, they generally don't move between the different strata. Uh, so we can start to look at the dynamics of metapopulations, look at their structure. The next series of slides will show a breakdown of metapopulations for, for examples of, of, of marl reef, say a six-month plagial larval duration. What is its construct? What is its, what, of what the equilibrium population there, how is it constructed? From where did the, uh, it derive all of its um, settlement and recruitment? So in the, in the simple case, we're looking at generation zero where we start purely natal, purely native, and we let the thing run using all those numbers that I showed earlier in the transition matrix, we just apply that to multi-generations. So things spit out, they settle, they spit out again, resettle, just run it many, many, many times and see what sort of structure do we end up at the different geographic strata examined. Uh, I should point out that most things in this simulation equilibrate at about 25 to 30 years, 30, 25 to 30 generations. Uh, but typically, I, I ran it out to 1,000 generations and looked at the equilibrium uh, metapopulation structures there. So in this case, it's just a view of two different pelagic larval durations, 15 days over here and 90 days over here. And what you would see is, predictably, for a very short pelagic larval duration, the endpoint population structure is very much uh, driven by where you're at. Whereas with the longer pelagic larval duration, there tends to be more more similarity between uh, adjacent geographies due to the large mixing effect of propagules. And this just shows some of the dynamics of how things evolve over time for many generations. And I know you can't get much out of this, but it, it was a pain in the butt to make this slide, so I want to show it. <laughs> it's a nice animation, actually. Um, so there's a lot of results that come out of this sort of simulation modeling. And how could we distill this down? How can we sift out something uh, useful that's very easy to, to, to visualize and, and understand? One such technique is ordination. We can dump all the data into an ordination, and in this case, non-metric multidimensional scaling. It's, a, it's an approach to sort of group data. It's an approach to examine dimensionality in the data as an exploratory means of seeing which what sort of things should we follow up on? So the next plot's gonna show some NMDS, non-metric multidimensional scaling results on the metapopulation structure that I showed earlier. And it's going to, um, I'll give you a hint, it's gonna to start to highlight the effects of pelagic larval duration, and we'll start to see some of the spatial relationships and affinities in the archipelago. Uh, what this does is just flash through uh, a series of different pelagic larval durations, and at the end it pulls them all together um, you don't have to worry too much about the axes on these plots. Basically, it's just a, it's a, it's a map of, of similarities. So we take all of the data and try to construct axes that map out how similar or how different things are. And the only thing you have to really know is that if the points are close together, it means things are fairly similar. If they're far apart, they're different. And if you can start to identify clusters or subsets of the data, that's a, a very useful output from this sort of an approach. And what it shows is that for the very short pelagic larval durations, 
uh, there's a big spread in the data. There's a lot of differences, uh, and things are very, am I out of time? Okay, oh, I'm almost done. And as pelagic larval duration increases, uh, there's more of a coalescence into some uniform type distribution because as things are out there for say a year, uh, there's, things are gonna start looking very similar overall, the geographic units examined. In summary, uh, we can gain new insights into uh, the early life history by using these computer models. Uh, this will help towards a lot of things, understanding connectivity, improving management, improving stock assessment, utility of protected areas, et cetera. Uh, future work in this area at the Science Center will involve co heavy collaboration with, with a variety of researchers, and some of the, the more interesting stuff we're doing right now involves collaboration with Dr. Chris Bird at HIMB. Uh, we'll be looking at transport modeling of OPE because he has such a great set of genetics data on the genet on, on, from that end, we can sort of compare it to what we predict from the transport modeling we can do on the computer. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Paliku ika pa ma kani ku ma ku a hakali ta o hu le wa ia ya kalawa e haka ano ole ke ya o hu no ke no ke hakala la ke ya manu ika o hu ika o hi a ha ma me ho o ha ma u ita le o kale hu a pa ne a pa ne mai pa hai ke ya ma mu e.